Anomaly Perspective on the Contemporary Debate about Justice in Higher Education. So have you all got this yellow? Yeah. Great, fab. OK, so um, I'm, gonna, I'm afraid I'm going to have to read this, even though I know I just can't emulate younger people who can just somehow put the whole thing in and just come out with it. I, I have to read it, so I'll just try to make it interesting. But this yellow, this kind of bright yellow thing, should help keep your, your attention you know, kind of primed there. So I've been working on a book on race and K through 12 education. And the idea of equality of opportunity in education plays a large role in that. But what I'm going to talk about today is a kind of spin-off from that work on race and K through 12 uh, education. It's very much a work in progress. I'm aware that there are various, um, you know, kind of gaps in my argument and on clarities, and it's the best I've been able to do as of uh, last night. <laughs> okay. The American public higher education system is world renowned for its historic role in providing education for middle and working class students. But in the past 15 or 20 years, I've been struck by how much media attention is paid to how many low-income students do or don't attend very elite colleges and universities. And this attention is generally accompanied by a fair amount of uh, hand-wringing. What percentage of Stanford or Yale or Harvard's entering classes from a low-income family? There's little or no attention to low-income students attending regular public institutions. This discourse ignores my students, you all, students here at UMass, and comparable public institutions who accept, for example, 50% or more of their applicants. UMass Boston accepts about 75% of its applicants. Only about 4%, 4% of college students attend an IHE with 25% or less selectivity. IHEs um, mean institutions of higher education, that is, colleges and universities. And I'm going to use that terminology, which is standard in this field, IHEs. Boston University, for example, has a 25% selectivity. So they're part of that 4% of students. And about 0.4% of students attend the super elite IHEs, like Stanford, which um, the, get the most public attention. I will suggest that this la laser focus on elite institutions reflects a faulty, a narrow, elitist, and undemocratic way of thinking about opportunity in relation to education. What we should mainly be concerned about are, one, the defunding and undervaluing of the public institutions the vast majority of moderate and low-income students actually attend. This includes an even higher proportion of black, Latinx, and Native American students to flag the specifically racial dimension of this problem. Two, the staggering and truly obscene overall class-based inequalities of which the overrepresentation of wealthy students at elite IHEs are merely one manifestation. And three, the unacknowledged abandonment of the democratic ideal of equal educational opportunity embodied in a strong, well-funded, and publicly supported higher education sector. Let me begin with an important study of higher education released in 2017, an analysis by Raj Chetty and others of a data set, a data set of 30 million college students, 30 million, born between 1980 and 1991 that included their their economic backgrounds, college attended, and post-college earnings. I'm on Roman II on the handout now. The study focused on what they called Ivy Plus IHEs, which are the eight Ivy League schools, plus Stanford, MIT, Duke, and the University of Chicago. But the same trends are found at highly selective IHEs more generally, that is those with a 25% or less acceptance rate. So here are some findings from Chetty's study that reveal the upper class slant of attendance at these IHEs. There's, these are kind of different ways of, of kind of seeing the, the class tilt, different stats that express it. One, the proportion of students at these IHEs from the richest 1% of families has increased during the last decade, while the proportion from the bottom 40% has decreased. Two. 
More students at these IHEs come from families in the top 1% of the income distribution than from the bottom 50%. There are more students from the top 1% than the whole bottom 50%. Three, children with parents in the top 1% are 77 times more likely to attend an Ivy Plus college than children with parents in the bottom 20%. Four, the median household income, that is the household income that half fam the families have above, half the households have above and half have below. The median income of students at these uh, IHEs is $171,000. The overall median of the country is 56,000. I couldn't find out the median of the whole student college population though. And five, this is from a different study. Another study of the 150 most selective IHEs found 74% of the students in those institutions come from the top quartile, that's the top one-fourth, and 3% come from the bottom one-fourth, the bottom 25%. These very lopsided wealth profiles of the Ivy Plus student populations suggest that Ivy Plus institutions are not admitting students based solely on their academic characteristics. There can't really be more talent, intellectual ability, work ethic, desire to achieve, and the like in children in the top 1% of the income spectrum than in the whole bottom 50%. Can there? No, there can't. <laughs> so let us look then at ways that the admissions process at these IHEs is slanted to favor the wealthy over lower and middle and lower income applicants. I'm on three now, Roman three. These processes fall into several different categories. One is that elite IHEs often employ admissions criteria that favor applicants based on attributes with little relationship to high school academic characteristics such as grades, high school rank, and SAT scores, but have a large relationship to family money. In an article on admissions at elite IHEs that I will be giving some attention to, Charles Klotfelter, an economist, notes that unpaid summer internships, travel abroad, and volunteering count in an applicant's favor, but the possibility of having these experiences is very dependent on the applicant's family resources. Another oft-noted practice is giving pre preference to legacies which is the name given to the offspring of the graduates of a particular IHE. This practice too has a class slant since graduates of IHEs are very likely to be more affluent than the family of an average college applicant. In one study, legacies got a 20% boost in admissions. That is, if you hold all other admission relevant characteristics constant, people who were legacies of that college got it, were 20% more likely to be accepted into that college. Legacy admission is a particularly blatant example of passing class privilege down through the generations. Another practice is giving an admissions boost to relatives of large donors, promised donors, or sometimes just hoped for donors to the IHE in question. Perhaps the most famous example of this is Jared Kushner, President Trump's son-in-law and policy advisor, who was admitted to Harvard because his family donated a lot of money. I believe that Daniel Golden's 2006 book, The Price of Admission, How America's Ruling Class Buys Its Way Into Elite Colleges and Who Gets Left Outside the Gates, was the first popular work to reveal this particularly crass form of wealth privilege in higher education. And Golden actually discusses Kushner specifically, but it was for, before Kushner had become part of the Trump family. In a recent important case concerning affirmative action, Harvard was reluctantly forced to reveal its participation in this practice. Another admissions practice is a well-documented shift in college financial aid from need-based need to so-called merit-based scholarship aid. Merit-based means admittees are offered scholarships based on what they've accomplished in high school, but independent of the applicant's need for the scholarship. So its overall effect is to steer more scholarship money to those who need it less and away from those who need it more. I'm not saying that there isn't some rationale for doing this, but it's the effect of it is what I'm highlighting here. 
A second general category of class-based aspects of the admissions process involve ways that wealthy families position their offspring for success in college admissions without contributing to their offspring's intellectual development or high school accomplishments. They can, for example, afford for their offspring to take the SAT tests uh, multiple times, which low and moderate income families generally can't do. Colleges count the applicant's highest score, so having the resources to take the test multiple times can be quite helpful in the admissions process. Parents can also hire private college counseling services. It's a very important phenomenon of our time. These services help high school students choose extracurricular activities, help with writing the personal statement, and crafting their applications in ways that make them more attractive to colleges. But these counseling services are quite pricey. Admissions officers will not generally admit to being influenced by these forms of packaging of the applicant. But this denial is not very plausible. Counseling services are doing a thriving business, so parents must believe they are getting some benefit for their money and are unlikely to be totally off base in this belief. In addition, a scandal from last year suggests that admissions officers can be taken in by false and misleading statements on applications. A high school in Florida routinely misrepresented the records of their graduating seniors, generally low-income black students, and enhance their applications in various ways similar to what counseling services do, although with a totally different population. For example, the school often exaggerated hardships a particular applicant had faced, and that's uh, benefited them in the, uh, in the admission process. Students from this school had been admitted to some quite well-regarded IHEs, including Harvard, and in the media coverage following the scandal, admissions officers admitted that they are not able to fact-check every application as they read hundreds upon hundreds of applications, devoting about 12 minutes to each, and so are vulnerable to being misled by some forms of uh, misrepresentation. The Florida case seems likely to be the tip of an iceberg, intensified by the increasingly fierce and sophisticated competition for the limited number of slots at elite IHEs. Okay, I'm now on 3C, Roman 3C. What exactly is wrong with these practices at both the IHE end and the parent end? Some would say they violate an ethical principle sometimes called equality of competitive opportunity and also called meritocracy. Um, this is the principle that candidates for a valued but scarce good, such as places in elite IHEs, should be selected on the basis only of personal merit and achievement, not enhanced by family resources. Sometimes the term meritocracy means not only that principle, but a system in which that principle is operating. Revealingly, the economist Charles Klotfelter mentioned earlier claims that, quote, America's most selective colleges have become steadily more meritocratic in their admissions criteria. This statement is remarkably ironic since Klotfelder's argument quite clearly shows and seemed intended to show that selective colleges are judging applicants according to attainments created by family wealth advantage, unpaid summer internships, taking SAT prep courses, take, retaking the test, and, and especially hiring private counselors rather than qualities and accomplishments equally open to those from non-privileged backgrounds. Klotfelter's thinking is a great example of an ideological legitimation of the system of class privilege the elite IHEs aim to uphold. This ideology is incoherent and yet superficially supp supplies the requisite peace of mind about the alleged justice of the system. What I think Klotfelter means by meritocracy in this context is that colleges increasingly re rely on what he calls documentable evidence of merit. Internships and improved SAT scores are indeed documentable, and they plausibly contribute to the desirability of a candidate. But it would only be a true meritocracy or equality of competitive opportunity if all high school students had an equal shot at acquiring those documentables. Yet if family wealth is essentially buying the documentables, as Klotfelter recognizes they are, then obviously there isn't an equal shot at acquiring them. The modest income applicant can generally not afford the unpaid summer internship and the multiple SATs, so there isn't uh, a meritocracy. 
Okay, so I want to suggest that the main problem with the class-based processes that I've mentioned is not that they violate meritocracy in college admissions. It's rather that they uphold a class stratified higher education system and operate with a wrong conception of opportunity. But before making this case, I need to mention a third category of class-based advantage in admissions. And it's that advantaged families are better positioned to develop the actual intellectual potential of their offspring than are disadvantaged families, not only supply, uh, provide them with superior packaging. They can send them to better schools, either private or well-funded public ones. They can supplement their schooling, including over the summer, with further intellectually enriching activities. If they themselves are also better educated, they can help their offspring develop intellectually in the ways they talk with them and ask them questions. In this respect, applicants with well-to-do parents will often have more genuine academic attainments than applicants from more modest backgrounds. It is not irrational of admissions offices to look on them more favorably, but the applicants have these advantages only because of their parents' wealth. So the admissions advantage is no less wealth slanted and unfair than the packaging advantages of category two, or it's unfair in being wealth slanted. In addition, the high school attainments do not by themselves prove that the students from more modest backgrounds have inferior intellectual potential, only that they may not have had as much of a chance to develop it yet, and it's a chance that college could possibly afford them. Finally, an obvious reason that elite private colleges so heavily tilt toward wealthy students is that they have outrageously high tuition costs, and they need a significant number of their admits to be full or almost full payers. Almost all of these institutions could not survive financially without admitting a substantial disproportion of wealthy applicants. Okay, I'm on four now, the bottleneck. In addition to class favoritism is a second problem in the admissions process as currently structured. Opportunity for a spot at a desirable college depends too much on a student's performance at a particular moment in her life graduating from high school at 18 years of age. Even if the class-based advantages and disadvantages discussed so far could be wiped away, students mature at significantly different rates. Some do not engage fully with high school or the aspects of high school that position them for college admission, but several years later might be fully prepared to rise to the college challenge. Many students do not want to go to college after high school. They may want to go to work, to avoid student debt, to be economically self-sufficient, or to serve in the military. They may need to help their families economically. IHEs like UMass Boston exist in part to serve the subset of these high school grads who decide down the road that now they are ready and they do want to go to college. A high percentage of college students, at least a quarter, probably more, and many of them at community colleges, are over 25 years of age. These students should not be closed out from life opportunities just because they weren't ready for that particular competition at age 18. And they are seldom recognized in this dominant discourse around IHEs that I've been talking about. As Joseph Fishkin argues eloquently and convincingly in his book, Bottlenecks, there should be multiple paths to educational and life success. And students should not be confined to being funneled through a single competition at age 18 for places at desirable IHEs. One reason for the obsession with elite IHEs and with low-income students getting into them may be an assumption that these institutions are a student's main ticket to a good job after college. As I will show, the instrumental value of a college education for jobs raises the issue of how IHEs are ranked, and I need to present this issue in some detail. I'm now in Roman 5 on the handout. <clears throat> Although there's no official ranking of IHEs, there is an unofficial one by the U.S. News and World Report that IHEs themselves rely on. The U.S. News rankings contribute to a widely, though by no means universally, shared public sense of a rough hierarchy of IHEs. This ranking has two different dimensions. The first is an ordinal ranking, which IHEs are above and below which others. 
U.S. News provides partial ordinal rankings in the colleges are classified into several general categories, national universities, national liberal arts colleges, regional universities, and regional colleges. UMass Boston is a national university in this scheme. IHEs are ranked within each of these categories. U.S. News also provides data on each institution that enables comparison of IHEs across these categories. For example, for a given IHE, the percentage of the student body in the top tenth of their high school graduation class. Students' range of scores, students at the college, their range of scores on the SAT or ACT standardized tests, and the acceptance rate of applicants. Same within Massachusetts, and just to give you some numbers, Boston University is ranked 42 in national universities, and 62% of their students were in the top tenth of their high school class. UMass Amherst is seven, number 70, with 34% in the top 10%. UMass Boston is 191, with 15% in the top 10th of their high school class. UMass Dartmouth is 215th, with high school rank not provided. All of these are national universities. Example of regional ones are Salem State and Fitchburg, which has a 6% 6 in the top 10th. Okay, a second aspect of, of rankings is the perceived distance between different rungs in the ranking. This is a much more amorphous uh, matter than the numerical rank order itself. Perceived, ru perceived rung distance is how much, quote unquote, better a college at rate at rung 38 is perceived to be than one at 70, 120, or 191. What's the kind of distance? Amorphous though it is, rung dis distance is nevertheless quite important for educational justice and opportunity. Employers' sense of rung distance affects how much positive or negative weight they give to where different job applicants attended college. Possibly there are empirical studies of comparative success in the job market among graduates of differently runged IHEs that would provide some measure of perceived uh, rung distance, but I'm not aware of them. However, some sense of how rung distance operates in the real world is provided by Lauren Rivera's remarkable study of hiring practices in elite law management consultant and investment bank firms in her book, Pedigree, How Elite Students Get Elite Jobs. Okay, now I'm at 5C. Rivera finds that for two-thirds of the hirers who are reading resumes to decide whom to interview, the perceived prestige of the applicant's graduate and undergraduate IHE plays a very large role in hiring decisions in comparison to job-relevant personal attainments such as grades, specific job-relevant skills, and previous work experience. Rivera reports that the hirers believe that, quote, failure to attend a super elite school was an indicator of intellectual failure regardless of a student's grades or standardized test scores. The decision to go, and also the decision to go to a lower ranked school because it was perceived by the hirers as a choice, was often interpreted as evidence of moral failings, such as faulty judgment or lack of foresight on the student's part. Rivera's findings suggest a very large perceived rung distance among the IHE tiers, and especially between the top tier and almost every IHE below it, for her subjects, hirers at these elite firms. Perceived rung distance swamps other job-relevant factors. As Rivera points it, uh, puts it, what the hirers regarded as relevant was the applicants being admitted and then choosing to attend these super elite IHEs in the first place, not a belief that the applicant received a superior education at their IHE. What would a smaller perceived rung distance look like? It would involve hirers paying much more attention to college grades and courses taken, work experience, and job-related knowledge and skills in comparison to the institutional prestige of the applicant's IHE. Rivera cites one of the one-third, remember two-thirds of them had the attitudes that I've just given, one of the one-third of her students who fell into the, this lower, run, this shrinking rung distance uh, category. 
She was a product of a working class family and an elite IHE. And this hirer said smart people of her background generally went to state universities and that she doesn't give much importance to the prestige of the college attendant. So I'm using this brief account of Rivera's study to make two points. One is just to give you some sense of what perceived rung distance is and how it operates to shape the competitive job opportunity terrain. Second, Rivera's findings suggest that the degree of rung distance assumed and embraced by the majority of the hirers she studied does an injustice to the applicants not from the top elite IHEs. It does so because they are not being assessed solely according to qualities relevant to the jobs in question that they were able to attain. And this injustice is of a class-based character since the more prestigious IHEs that the hirers favor serve a higher income student body than those with less prestige. Thus, the use of rung distance in hiring compounds the class-based injustice we saw earl earlier in the admissions process to get into the super elite IHEs in the first place. The students of modest background are disproportionately excluded from these IHEs and then are further disadvantaged at the job search stage by employers using their perceptions of rung distance to undervalue these students' accomplishments at the IHEs they do attend. So if we're concerned about opportunity and justice in higher education, we have to pay attention to rung distance and whether a particular deployment of perceived rung distance is justified. So by citing Lauren Rivera, she's talking about um, a kind of job stratum at the tippy, tippy top, not necessarily of real desirability, but of money. And so it, it might be that many other employers don't, um, don't have the same rung distance that those people at the top do. And I'm not claiming that her thing is typical. I'm just, you know, I, I just didn't know how to find out about rung distance and her thing at least spoke to it. So that's why I presented that to you. I realize my account of rung distance is rather underdeveloped and I hope to be able to make it more precise as I proceed with this project. Meanwhile, I think we can learn something importantly relevant to it by looking again at the Chetty study mentioned earlier. We noted the study's findings that IHE admissions is quite substantially tilted towards applicants from wealthy families. I'm now at 5D. But this same data implies something else pertinent to rung distance. Namely, that as the wealth profile of students at super elite IHEs increases, there are these students' intellectual potential decreases relative to students at lower ranked IHEs. This is why. Part of the reason more wealthy students are being admitted is, as we have seen, a combination of admissions processes favoring the wealthy, unpaid summer internships, favoritism towards legacies and donors' relatives, and so on, and more sophisticated packaging of applications from wealthy applicants, such as the private counseling services provide. To represent this process schematically, philosophers like to do this sometimes, um, let Q be the threshold of the quality of application required to be admitted to a highly selective IHE. Q is a combination of I, which is intellectual and other achievements, and P, the packaging that wealth is able to confer. Now, P itself is a combination of admission wealth bias and parental wealth application enhancement. So Q equals I plus P. I hope that's clear. But applicants with a slightly higher I but distinctly less P will not meet the Q threshold because their I plus P is going to be below the Q threshold. But this group is intellectually superior as a group to the wealthy students it, with a hefty P component of their application that those students require to meet the Q threshold. These, the students I'm talking about who weren't admitted have a, uh, a greater I. So they, are, they have more intellectual potential, at least in this schematic argument. The non-admitted group will end up at lesser ranked IHEs. This argument applies only to the defined groups in general, not to every subgroup within those groups. For example, some wealthy students will not require the hefty P to be admitted, even if they actually have the hefty packaging, and this argument does not apply to them. On the other hand, the argument applies as well to non-applicants with the same I as the rejected applicants. 
the quality of student at IHEs with a large percentage of wealthy students is declining relative to both some non-applicants and rejected applicants who attended lesser ranked IHEs. It's remarkable to me that observers and scholars of higher education have failed to notice this clear implication of intellectual decline as a byproduct of the significant overrepresentation of the wealthy at super selective IHEs. I have some suspicions about this failure, but I'll have to leave that for another time. Okay, I'm now on 5D3. The Chetty study shows that this situation has, if anything, gotten worse since 2000. This is not surprising since despite efforts to improve the numbers of low income students at many Ivy Plus and, and other elites, overall income inequality has gotten worse over this period. The distance between the top 20% and the rest, the distance between the top 1% and the rest have all increased. Also, the sociologist Sean Reardon has shown that wealthy parents have become both more dedicated to and more skilled at turning their own financial and other capital advantages into educational benefit for their offspring. This phenomenon is pointedly called opportunity hoarding, a useful formulation because it implies that favoritism toward the wealthy is not merely an unintended result of admissions processes, but is at least partly due to wealthy parents working the system as it exists to advantage wealthy offspring as a group. Not that they're aiming to advantage wealthy offspring as a group, they're only aiming to village their own kid, but as a group process, it, it aims to, I, I mean, it has the effect of uh, advantaging wealthy offspring. This captures a systemic aspect of wealth dominance, which is also referred to as plutocracy. The overall upshot is that there are many students attending a given IHE who are equal or superior in intellectual potential to many students who are attending higher runged IHEs. So this also means that many, many more students than the ones actually admitted to a given higher ranked IHE could have been successful at that particular institution had they been admitted. This is a major point in my argument. It's at 5D4. This observation is supported also by our discussion of the bottleneck problem that students' high school performance at age 18 often does not tell us much about what they are capable of when they are ready to engage. In addition, standardized test scores like the SATs are themselves only weakly predictive of overall college success. So altogether, we have to recognize that what, what might roughly be called the, the quality of student is not lately stratified the way the US News rankings of the IHEs are, especially in light of the class-based distortions highlighted in the Chetty Report there may be much more overlap in quality of student among IHEs at different rungs than the prevailing wisdom would imply. This view of college students goes against the current widely held view, though generally not articulated as such, which could be summarized as, quote, you didn't get into Yale, so you aren't good enough for Yale. The super elite IHEs cultivate an image and a brand of superiority, specialness, and exclusivity. This does not readily lend itself to admitting, sure, many, many non-attendees of Yale could have been successful at Yale had they ended up there. And the frenzy over college admissions encourages students who did not get into Yale or you know, any other that's stand in for any uh, elite IHE or did not apply to think of themselves and the institution they end up attending in a misleadingly stratified way, that neither they nor their institution is good enough. I'm not saying that all college applicants and their families are caught up in this frenzy. I think many students at UMass Boston aren't, though some definitely are. Even sensitive critics of elite higher education may succumb to this conventional wisdom. Mitchell Stevens, in his perceptive book, Creating a Class, about admissions practices at an unnamed liberal arts college, speaks unproblematically of competition over what he calls the cream of each year's admissions pool. This phrase refers to high school seniors with close to perfect board scores, almost all A's in high school, and impressive extracurricular activities. The competition involves the IHEs throwing scholarship money and other goodies their way to entice them to come to their particular college. 
But Stephen's use of cream of the pool implies that we, that we know that these applicants are going to be the top performing college students and by implication will rise to the top of their professions and contribute exceptionally to society. That's a kind of general implication of this, this uh, phrase. But we know no such thing merely on the basis of these students' stellar high school records. There are too many variables between an 18-year-old school performance, especially when it rests substantially on wealth and privilege, and what kind of adult, professional, citizen, and even college student that particular high school student will turn out to be. At one point in the Harvard Affirmative Action case I, I briefly mentioned earlier, an official of the university admitted that very many rejected applicants to Harvard would have been perfectly successful students at Harvard had they been admitted. Harvard accepts only about 5% of those who apply, so the non-admits are a very large number. This is a remarkable admission, very much at odds with Harvard's brand that casts each Harvard student as uniquely excellent and special while collectively constituting the top of the heap of their college cohort. I am adding to the Harvard officer's admission that many more students who did not apply to Harvard, including some UMass Boston students, I would say, could also have been successful had they ended up attending Harvard by whatever route. This claim is further supported by the fraudulent applications from the Florida school mentioned earlier of students admitted to Harvard and apparently making their way successfully through Harvard's program. An overblown sense of rung distance between different tiers in an IHE ranking is just a further manifestation of the wealth dominance that we saw operating at the IHE admissions level. With minor exceptions, our higher education system has become increasingly stratified by wealth. And it would not be far wrong to say that students from middle class, working class, and low income backgrounds have their own institutions and rich kids have theirs. This isn't exactly right, but it's much too close for comfort for a democracy. Further supporting my argument that many students at lesser ranked IHEs could have been successful at higher ranked ones is the success of affirmative action programs. Affirmative action involves underrepresented racial minorities, that is black, Native American, and Latinx, and some uh, Asian groups. Um, I'm sorry, involves those groups being admitted to highly selective IHEs with lesser conventional academic high school qualifications than whites who are admitted. These students are, genuine, are generally successful at the higher ranked IHEs to which they are admitted under these programs. Their success implies that many white and Asian students enrolled in lesser ranked IHEs who have qualifications similar to the affirmative action admits could have been similarly successful had they been admitted. Now, note, this is in no way an argument against affirmative action which I totally support, support on reparative justice and to some extent diversity grounds. So, so affirmative action success further supports the view that the quality of student is more similar among differently ranked IHEs than is generally assumed. The implication of my overall argument about quality and potential of student and rung distance is that shrinking the perceived rung distances among the different rungs in the academic hierarchy, sort of like closing up an accordion, but an accordion that's vertical, <laughs> that, um, is part of the path to educational justice. We should see number 15 as much closer to number 40, and that to number 70, and that to number 191, UMass Boston, than the conventional wisdom now does. Although we and this country have grown accustomed to a very highly stratified higher education framework, it is far from impossible to imagine other alternatives. Malcolm Gladwell, the Canadian writer, describes applying to Canadian universities in the 1970s where he says, there was not a strict hierarchy. What counted, he says, was what you did once you got there. Perceived rung shrinkage would benefit graduates of non-elite IHEs because their job and life prospects would be less burdened by class disadvantage than under our current regime of perceived rung distance. And equality of competitive opportunity would also be better realized because employers' decisions about who to hire would be more responsive to applicants' actual qualifications than to assessments of the prestige of their colleges. Okay, so conclusion six. Uh, 
Romans 6. I focus so much attention on the issue of rung distance because I've seen so little attention to it and its significance for educational justice and democracy. But securing equal opportunities for the broad mass of moderate and low-income students, both for education and for the desirable jobs and life goods to which education is a gateway, would of course require other significant structural reforms beyond this rung shrinkage thing. And so just to indicate, this is a big area just very briefly, crushing student debt or the prospect of it hanging over so many students and graduates severely constrains higher education's ability to create a level playing field among students. I believe that student debt is now, listen to this, $1.5 trillion. That's student debt in this country. Um, as, and also, but related to this, as we all know, for the past 40 years or so, states have increasingly defunded their prized state universities, sometimes using as a rationale that the state universities are still a bargain compared with the staggering price of the privates. But this is the wrong standard. The whole point of state universities is to be accessible to all residents of the state, no matter their family incomes. I've taught for long enough to remember when it cost $500 a year to come to UMass Boston. That's $2,400 in today's dollars. Now it costs about $14,000. These costs make the experience and stresses of college very different for students of different economic backgrounds. And I just want to mention that different um, states handle this different. So it's not as if every state is as bad as, as Massachusetts. For example, CUNY, where Charles teaches, their students pay $7,000 a year, half the price that you guys pay. Um, I am heartened that we're seeing an upsurge, especially among young people, against these inequalities in education and against inequality and plutocracy more generally. Our current arrangements are by no means inevitable. Um, and I, I just, uh, just want to say, <laughs> as a conclusion here, we have to continue the struggle for the democratic ideal of equal educational opportunity, powered by a strong, well-funded, and publicly supported and valued higher education sector. Enough about Harvard already. <laughs> so, um, could I just say, could I, ask um, if students have a question as a first category of questioner. Any students who would like to pose a question? Of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, hold on. Oh, yeah, yeah, hold it. Thank you, Professor. I really appreciate you mentioned about the, the rock distance because it's not only the problem of the you know, domestic um, uh, Native American student, but also for the global education. So, in, 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 for example, in China, everybody knows that we got a very strict exam systems because of the growing eco economy. So the parents were more willing to send the student out of to the to stay to be more personal development, except for taking become the uh, exam machines. But now you see that the American higher ed education itself is the full of sense of hierarchies and the, you know with, with this kind of stereotypes. And also, people realize that. You know, the higher education actually with the field with the most stereotype. For example, uh, the, the, the people who cannot enroll in the, the college uh, in the 18 years old uh, will seem to be fail, fa failures. And also, you know, the, the people who don't enroll into the elite college was regarded as the failures. So uh -huh. what do you think is it the, was the most, uh, was the key point to eliminate this kind of stereotype as a, Philosopher Great. professor, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great, Th thanks. Thanks very much. I, d I didn't know enough about the Chinese situation, but I had that impression. I think there's a scholar named Yang Zhao who who writes about this issue, and I had the impression that this same hierarchicalization with the parents, wealthy parents, pouring so much money into their kids, prepping to pass the exams that get them in the top. But you make a great point when you add to that the kind of stereotypes the kids at those different uh, tiers, they, I mean, they, they're getting those stereotypes partly through the way their parents are talking to them, but it's partly a product of the hierarchy itself. And I don't know as much um, about how that particular piece operates 
in this country. I do, though, think that a strong hierarchy is basically an anti-democratic uh, entity itself, or sort of a system itself, and it's bound to generate attitudes that are non-democratic in, in character. And so I think that's another aspect of the democracy that I'm calling for, though you know, I didn't talk about that today, but great question. Other student questions? Hey. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I wanted to first thank you uh, oh, for oh. the whole thing, and, and it's been great. And um, I first wanted to, uh, I really resonated with a lot of what was said uh, growing up in Newton, but like with a single parent Latina mom, it was very different, and I, I definitely could hear both sides pulling into me different perspectives. And with that being said, um, I, the question I, I'll, I guess I want to ask is how do we, I think, and kind of attesting to what your question, I think that there's a, a, a kind of moral shift, a, a change, an alternate conception that we kind of need to address some of what we're talking about in this issue. And, and my question is, if we know that a lot of this status and an ideal that we have of the student is based off just perception, um, and we know that <clears throat> all these different things tie into it, whether it's their self, if, social, if wealth is defining their social status and then it's tied to their identity, which then ties into their self-worth and their worthiness, then that obviously eliminates them from being able to engage with people in trying to contribute to a better society. So if we know all these things and they're kind of integrated with like our capitalist notions of, of being the strongest will survive and all that, and, and, and we're tying it to, you know, if you don't get into this, then you're not good enough, then you're not, you're not worthy enough. If we know that these are kind of some of the underlying foundations of this kind of mindset, um, I think some of what our first, uh, our second presenter, uh, Mr. Wong, if I'm not mistaken, um, was talking about valuing, um, kind of creating a, a perception of, of valuing others and cherishing others of, of every individual and, uh, and of every capability. And at the end, I think he closed with uh, weaknesses are not always a weakness. And so I think that kind of starts to speak to that moral shift that we do need. And so my question to you, finally, <laughs> is uh, how do we like largely systematically implement that type of mindset? Because I think when I have these conversations, I usually end up feeling very like, let's all like come together and hey, hold hands and kumbaya. And I, I think that we're all hearing it through different little lenses and how do we collectively start to integrate this so that it doesn't come off like that because yeah. that's what's needed. Okay, so basically what you, <laughs> what you asked was, how do we completely reshape society so that it has, it's basically an egalitarian democratic <laughs> society and it doesn't have all of these uh, very damaging kinds of uh, hierarchies. And um, of course, that's the question of, that's the, que the right question to ask. I don't exactly have an answer to that. You know, I, mean, I thought it was enough, to just get to where I was able to get, you know, with the, <laughs> with the conference, <laughs> with the <laughs> presentation, um, I. But I don't think I will say this. I don't think it's enough if people, you know, like you say, get together and and sing kumbaya, kumbaya together. You have to change the structures in some way. But I. I also feel, you know, Ch Charles was saying earlier that there is a kind of movement of in an egalitarian direction among a much broader part of the population than we have seen before. And you, know, you saw it first in the Bernie Sanders movement of 2016. You know, that kind of stuff is headed in the right direction. It's not enough. You know, this is like deeply entrenched. But it's a hopeful sign of our moment. And just jo join that. <laughs> Okay, so in, in other, other. Five or six questions on the list, so. Okay. I, I, I mean, I'm glad to stay, you know, I'm glad to stay here as long as you want to ask me questions. Uh, thank, thanks, Larry. 
I think you know it's it's quite right, uh, and I, I appreciate you detailing the mechanisms whereby these elite schools serve to perpetuate undemocratic class hierarchy. But I'm wondering if, in some ways, at a deeper level, it, it works somewhat differently. That in fact, these elite schools are using the fact of class hierarchy to remain elite. That is to say that if they reformed they would stop being elite if they started to admit, they understand that, the cla that wealth and certain class hierarchies is going to get people onto the Supreme Court. If it turns out that the Supreme Court was filled with three law schools that was Suffolk, Brooklyn Law, and New England Law School, they would be the elite schools. So in order to remain elite, Harvard can't help but try and predict who are going to be the powerful leaders of society in order to remain Harvard. And since they know it's a class-based thing, they have to have their admission policies be, feed into that, take off on that, because that's the most predictable thing. And so they would simply lose their status if they didn't somehow jerry-built an admissions process that's going to favor yeah. the class structure. So in some sense, I mean, this oh. is a, a sort of a shallow and obvious observation, but uh, they, the, the democracy deficit, to locate it to any significant degree in the schools is maybe wrong because they have to reflect the fact that it's an undemocratic society, and that's what gives them their status. So, so like changing the causal connection somewhat. Not that there's not a lot to the mechanisms you point out. You know, I mean, this is a chicken and egg issue. It can be some, some, of, some of both, both of that. I mean, yes, but that's a good point, Mitch. That, that, that's definitely part of what's going on. I do think that the elites, they can't really give up their elite status and be the same thing as they are. So that's true. That's true. But what you would have to do is raise up, so you know, this is the way I'm seeing it, you kind of raise up the state sector so that it's more like what it used to be. It's not as if the way it is now is like the way it's always been in this country. Um, the, on the Supreme Court, there used to be people that were from more like Suffolk. It's now, it's all Harvard and Yale. All nine of them are from Harvard and Yale. And it's a really great group, those nine, that we've got on the Supreme Court. So you, and it used to be much more from a bunch of different law schools. And it's a great example, I think, actually, of something really screwed up going on. Yeah. Your mom has to go. So oh. we're just going to stop. It's going to have a incredible look. Incredible visitor, Larry's mother. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Okay, Ma. Thanks for what coming. What I want to know is is it a stereotype to think that. From the home of Speaker Pelosi. <laughs> <laughs> to think That's true. That a Jewish mother is extremely proud of her son. <laughs> 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 Is that a Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> when it, whatever I am, it's because of her. <laughs> so, where's Chris? Oh, back there. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Professor Blum. I was wondering if you no, you're not can, talking can you hear me? It. Make sure it's. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I was wondering if you would support a lottery system for all of the qualified applicants. Support what? A, a lottery. A lottery. System. Uh huh. And with, for all of the qualified applicants uh -huh. who can't get a spot uh -huh. at a school like Harvard because there's only so many places. And if you think there's any chance sort of following up on Mitchell's point of convincing schools like Harvard to go into a lottery system since uh -huh. they're willing to admit that there's so many more applicants who are qualified well, than they have a place for. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, no, there's no chance that that would happen because the, your use of qualified, which was also my use of qualified, is not the way Harvard, so that admissions officer admitted that, but he wasn't admitting it in the spirit of my talk at all. He was admitting, admitting it as a defense of Harvard's affirmative action program, which is under some challenge in this, 
in this case. And he was kind of saying, OK, many more students um, might be successful intellectually, but we wouldn't have the special quality of Harvard if we just took a merely qualified person who could do our program perfectly well. We need to have the most special thing. So that goes contrary to the idea of the lottery. Now, I just want to mention that in the 2003 affirmative action case, I think it's this one, because Michigan Law School, University of Michigan Law School is a very elite law school, was uh, their, their, their program was upheld. Justice Clarence Thomas, not that I you know, like anything he ever says, but <laughs> he did bring up, he said, why couldn't the University of Michigan just have a lottery system for qualified applicants? And then you wouldn't have to have all this affirmative action problem. I thought that was like a right on statement. And you can. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was, I, well, that, that's a follow up. I was. <coughs> no, I don't. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about a couple of practical things? Number one, uh, what keeps uh, this university in the disrepair that it's in? What, uh, what, what keeps it from uh, hiring uh, uh, more people to teach the very good students that come here? Uh, what, comes, uh, uh, what keeps this university from uh, keeping a chancellor who actually had the children, uh, the kids at, at heart? Okay. The, board of the people who are on the Board of Education, the people who are the trustees, just out of curiosity, what college or university did they go to? So what happens is they replicate those very values. Uh, they, uh, from their exalted peak, they look down upon UMB and they see it as uh, very, very far down. And why do these students, who may or may not be capable, but they don't know the difference, uh, why, why do they need uh, what they consider frills? Uh, if you walk through Harvard Law School, you'll see frills. If you walk through a Harvard Medical School, you'll see frills. But if you walk through here and, uh, and you see people having to pay uh, exorbitant amounts of money to park their car because this yeah. was supposed to be an urban university, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. uh, you, you'll, you'll see what the real costs of that kind of corruption are. So number one, uh, fo laser focus on the, uh, on the trustees and, and put some heat on them since their meetings are closed or uh, when uh, you know, the professors and students stand at the back peacefully with signs and expect to get listened to. That's crazy. Uh, you well, need to put the heat on those people. That's, that's so number one. And the other thing is those private <laughs> schools, the St. Grottle sex, in the last 20 or 25 the years, there have been several studies done on it. They don't go into public service. They go into finance. Yeah. And, that's right. And a that's third, not really helping the culture. A third of Harvard graduates go into finance or management consultancy. But in terms of the general thing, there, there is a really good movement you know, on campus that is, you know, I, I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm retired and I'm not in touch with that kind of thing. But it's not as if UMass Boston students aren't aware of the problem that you say. So there, there are people out there, you know, Fight, fighting for that, and that that fifteen dollar parking thing is just revolting. It's it's unbelievable. I agree. Uh, hi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I think this the, this was wonderful, and I love the things you're pointing to. And I'm wondering, a sort of an additional turn on this is sort of asking you to reflect a bit on. Um, what a number of people pointed out earlier today was the way in which your own wonderful career as a philosopher as, and as a published philosopher has been shaped by your teaching here yeah, yeah. and by the students that you've worked with and mentored and learned from being UMB students and not elite yeah. students. And so I'm wondering about the, if, among the things that we need to learn to value differently is when we think about research universities in particular, mm -hmm. the importance of faculty being discombobulated by their students uh -huh. um, and having students whose life experience and knowledge and community-based and family-based knowledge is very, very different from the knowledge that the majority of their faculty are likely to uh -huh. have. And so what um, among the possible routes 
into trying to change the system of prestige ranking and so on mm -hmm. would be if we thought about the importance of the work being done by researchers like you resting. I mean, you'd have been spectacular and wonderful and done marvelous and socially important things, I think, no matter where you'd have ended up. But I think a number of people have pointed out, and I think you yourself would say this, that the work that you do has been deeply informed by these being the students you've interacted with. And what, so what if we sort of intervened at this level of what's the work that we value and where do we see that work coming from and what is it that it takes to nurture that work? Oh. Wow. Um, I mean, l let me just first say that there are a lot of people at UMass Boston um, who, who are very engaged in the kind of community-based uh, research work that you, that you mentioned. It's, I mean, it, I, I haven't kept up with the, as it were, latest, but it's been true through the many decades I've been here that that has been an important um, strand, shall we say, in the sort of faculty um, self-understanding at, at UMass Boston, and I just think I'm, I'm part of that. Um, and, and you know, my, my colleagues in the, in the philosophy department and, you know, other colleagues in other departments whom I know personally are doing this kind of work that, that does involve being challenged by, <laughs> by your own students. And, and I definitely feel that my, my own uh, scholarly work is, has been very affected by um, not feeling like I just have this philosophical issue and I can just come lay it lay it on my students, you know, that, that they just are bringing a whole aspect of life experience that I can't assume that any particular traditional framing of an issue is going gonna, is gonna to work. And, you know, I've, I've loved the students. I've been here. I have taught occasionally elsewhere as a visiting professor, and I've always been very happy to come back. And, um, you know, I, I can't necessarily say what the systemic changes you would need to sort of make that a, a more um, substantial part of the culture here, and also the second part of your question, which is how, how would we use that kind of informed uh, teaching and scholarship to sort of raise the profile and the stature of, uh, you know, of places like UMass Boston in the, in the public mind, so to speak. But, I'm, you know, I, I just didn't get to, couldn't figure out solutions. I just couldn't think about it. I just can only get that far. But I'll let you know, though, because I, <laughs> I know you. So when I figure it out, I'll. Thank you. Anyway, great, great question. So uh, I want to say that there's one uh, piece of uh, evidence you could use, draw on that you didn't about why um, many more students could uh, succeed in, at elite Institutes of high, institutions of higher education, which is legacy admits themselves, given that legacy admits <laughs> basically do okay, but they, um, you know, uh -huh. they're admitted right at, uh, I say, of this 20% boost that you uh -huh. cite, that is evidence that's quite different from the different kind of affirmative action admits, right? So there's legacy affirmative Good. action, and then yeah. there's, say, uh, race, and sometimes uh -huh. class and donor, advantage. Donor right, advantage. Donor admits. affirmative action, right? There's, so there are many forms of affirmative action uh -huh. collectively. Yeah, yeah. Those different forms of affirmative action demonstrate, right, that uh, you could have a broader range of students succeeding. Yeah. But I guess I read your um, argument as not being anything about actually why, say, elite IHGs should change their admissions, but instead no. about why no. employers, uh, right, and the general society should, in fact, uh, uh, shrink the rung distance, right, and, and not assume that those who have gone to elite IHGs are any better on average, at least uh, keeping grades and work experience, et cetera, constant, as those who, are, who attended IHEs at much lower rungs and that that's where we want to change things. But I want to note that then there's actually, I think, a self-contradiction in your argument because what you're saying is for admission to elite IHEs, they are paying attention to things that essentially can be mediated by wealth. So standardized test scores, grades, work experience, like unpaid internships, volunteer experiences, all of those are very, very significantly mediated by wealth um, 
unintentionally or often intentionally through intentional family investments, right? That is also true at the higher education level. So students' grades, students' work experience in the summer, their capacity to take on unpaid internships, their capacity to take on research assistantships to professors as opposed to taking on custodial jobs or dining hall jobs that may pay a few extra dollars an hour more, but not give them the, the same kinds of access. Uh, their standardized test scores for the GMAT or you know the LSAT or whatever, all of those are also mediated by wealth. So if what you're saying is employers should attend to those markers rather than attend to the status of the university and deciding whom to employ, I think that you are still offering a very, very significant wealth mm -hmm. advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are getting rid Good. of one source of yeah. disproportionate wealth advantage, but you're leaving in place a bunch of others. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, I you know maybe overused the Lauren Rivera study, you know, with with her one the the one third of the hirers who said we were I don't care about the prestige thing. But what you're pointing out is there are a lot of other ways that wealth is translated into things that it's reasonable of employers to look at. So you would need a more radical kind of undermining of the whole system. I, I don't think I was mainly in a way saying employers should do this. I'm more using that as a kind of symptom or something about the overall structural problems. That's my kind of main target. But yes, you're, you're right that those wealth differences uh, sort of continue through and translate into, you know, bi biases at the employer level that it's reasonable of employers to, to use. Hi, Larry. Thank you so much. Um, my question is really kind of a follow-up on several of the other questions, but um, if we're looking at the perceived wrong distance, um, it seems that what you're suggesting is, well, we ought to get people in, in the position of employers to see that those people who don't have the wealth advantages are just as good. But I don't think that most employers are really trying to hire the best person mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. They want to hire the people who, I mean, they're going to hire an adequate person who fits with their culture. And the people who fit with their culture are typically people who went to the same kind of schools they went to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I, I kind of don't think mm -hmm. that, that the wrong distance from their point of view is reflecting merit or quality. Uh -huh. It's reflecting uh -huh. class status. And that's exactly what they want it to reflect, and that's what they're using when they hire people from those universities. <coughs> That's so depressing, Sally. <laughs> yes. Well, look, I think that but it's yes, probably the case that the UMass philosophy department hires faculty not just simply on the basis of merit, but whether it's going to fit with the culture of UMass philosophy department. Right? Everybody does this, and it's not irrational to do that. You don't say, oh, well, how are we going to decide who is the best philosopher? I can't stand it when people go around saying, let's hire the best philosopher, because that's... <laughs> I mean, but it's kind yeah. of a bullshit thing. Yeah, right. And it's not always the best way to proceed when you're building a department or building yeah. a firm or building a company or something like that. And so to say, oh, but they're just as good. Look at their, they're smart. And I go, I don't care whether, smart isn't the only thing. So on one hand, I want to s agree that smart is the only thing. But on the other hand, of course, I don't think that class is the thing that ought to matter. Yeah, right? that ought to replace. Right, right, right. But I just think it's complicated. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> no, I agree. And actually, in Rivera's um, just totally fabulous book, there's an aspect of what she finds that completely fits into that. That is that people at these, you know, incredibly elite firms, so it's, you know, I don't know that it applies to every firm, but that they are looking for playmates, essentially. I think she uses that terminology, actually. And and that's it, yeah. And it's it's totally class, uh, you know. It, I mean, the degree of lack of self knowledge of the people that she interviews about the class hierarchy that they're reproducing is really staggering. Because these people, it, I mean, it makes you wonder what did they? What's the fabulous education they got at these <laughs> super agents? They don't know anything about the world they're part of. Anyway, great depressing point. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. It was a fan fantastic talk okay. and event. Um, I just have a comment, which is 
I just want to say how I'm reading your paper, which is that basically what you're advocating is that UMass Boston should rise in the rankings of US News and World Report. I completely agree. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I, you know, as, as you know, as you well know, I was using the you know, as, as a report to, I know, yeah. but I do think that as well, but I, it's not what I was arguing. Last um, question. So a, a lot of this makes it seem uh, uh, like the, you, you want the elites to, to give up a lot here and you want, you want uh, both elite universities to, to lose some status but also uh, c class privileged families to lose um, some, some status and some power and opportunity as well. Yeah. And I just thought, consistent with everything you're saying, there are a lot of ways in which um, the things that you want actually do coincide with the self-interest of elite families. Um, this kind of super stratified hierarchy is very damaging to children of elite families, I think. Um, and this is something that I've noticed um, very acutely uh, spending my last six years in Palo Alto, California. So there's a, there's a train, there's like a commuter rail type train that runs from San Francisco to San Jose. And it passes through, I don't know how many smaller towns, maybe 20, 30 smaller towns. Um, Palo Alto is the, mo the most wealthy of, of these towns uh, on the train line. Um, it's, it's where Stanford sits, and it's where the most hyper-educated elite families live. It's also the only part of the train line where there are 24-7 security guards next to the train tracks because high school students in Palo Alto routinely throw themselves in front of the train in order to commit suicide because of the, the inc incredible high pressure of this, of this environment. Um, the packaging that you talk about in, in terms of uh, admissions credentials is, is, very, is very stressful for these students. Uh, it's very damaging to their <coughs> mental health, damaging to their relationships with family, and damaging to their overall life prospects. And, and, and as you hinted earlier, the, the type of jobs that we're talking about in, in Rivera's study, the elite management law firm consulting and also Silicon Valley style tech jobs that are now yeah, yeah. becoming more and more uh, common in, in Boston. Um, are, these are also pressure cooker environments where people work 80 hour weeks doing tasks that they don't want to do and they're miserable. Um, so I just, I, this is I think consistent with everything you're mm -hmm. saying here, but, but this is all mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. everything in here is about justice, as yeah, it yeah. were, Good. and not about self-interest or efficiency. And um, I just thought I would say that as, as a way of kind of uh, pointing out s some, some ways in which this is actually not, uh, the, the, kind of, the kind of general perspective that you want to take on this is not necessarily unfriendly to elite institutions or, or families. So may, maybe I, I not understand the implications of what you're saying, Chris. There's a way of hearing what you just said, which is to say that the uh, you know younger generation of these families might be willing to, uh, in order to get you know a less pr pressured environment, would be willing to trade some prestige in where they end up in college, and they might be willing to have either the places they do end up sink in the rankings or that they would go to one that's lower in the rankings and that they would think, you know, at least I avoid this thing where I'm ending up under the train, under the train car. So in a way, so to go back to the, um, the Newton question earlier, it, it could be that um, some of those students could be as it were part of the movement that I'm envisioning. You know what I mean? That they, you know, it's, it's, there's a little bit of an analogy with a kind of people from the 60s who came from fairly privileged families and thought, is this really worth it? And, you know, and some of that does seem to be happening. I, I wasn't as tuned into these issues you're talking about, which seem sort of extreme, but can I take your insight and, and kind of use it in that way? I think so, yeah. I think, it's, I think it may be a kind of an implication of uh, what you're saying about shrinking the the rung the rung distance would would take a lot of that pressure off of of 
yeah. kids, uh, kids right. from elite families, yeah. and just the, the environment. In that family. Yes. Oh, and in the elite institutions yes. themselves. Yes. What I was trying, like this gentleman and, and the lady uh, before me, I think it reminded me of fashion. I, I, it, it sounds like the fashion industry. Like Chanel is exclusive, and Chanel, because of your two words, it's exclusive and it's superior. And Louis is Louis because you know you can buy this, and people are like, oh wow, you have this and you have that, but it's superficial. And the same thing if you went to Harvard, oh you paid this for that, like this degree, it's superficial. So I think it goes back down to recognizing that this. Goes back a little bit to what Dr. Wong or Mr. Wong was saying about like learning more about the deep connection that we have as humans. As 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 I don't know, there's a deeper sense of it. Yeah, that yeah. I think we're Good. all kind of skipping over. Fair. And, and I think that's where the kumbaya thing comes again. But no, fair enough. Fair enough. That's a, that's a great that's a great point. I'm sorry, I didn't actually mean to put down that insight. I I really agree with this that insight. It's a little bit. Where, how you get that insight to be embodied in, in your vision for actual change. But thank you, and I guess we, we have to stop now. I want to thank Larry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks, Larry. Thank you, guys. <laughs>